Hi, everybody. This is Bill Noble from Token Metrics, and welcome to our Women's History Month series where we feature high profile crypto influencers. This morning, I'm joined by Amber. Amber, how you doing? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. Can you, you know, tell us a little bit about you? You know, tell us, you know, where you come from and how you got into crypto? Uh, yes, so I am based. I'm based in London. Uh, my dad is uh, Lebanese. My mom is French. So I've lived a little bit around emerging market growing up, and then uh, moved back to uh, the developed world. Um, I've got in touch with crypto. I would say it's a it's a funny story because it all started with uh, Napster. If you remember, I'm sure you do remember. Napster was uh, the first uh, centralized peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system. And at the time, I was a teenager in Lebanon, and it was very difficult to, we didn't have all of the CDs. I was a big fan of music, right? We didn't have, it was difficult to access the CD. So for us, Napster was a, a beautiful a, a beautiful treasure of to discover new music and discover movies and, and the rest. And then suddenly, Napster was offline because of Lars Ulrich from Metallica, who decided to uh, to ask the, the US government to, to, to shut it down. It got shut down because it was centralized, so it was on one server. So we all moved to something that is called Gnutella. So the Gnutella protocol was the first decentralized peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system in the world. And it was running on a protocol that is called the gossip protocol, which is basically how the computers were communicating with one another. And I was quite involved in the community and the, in the maintenance, uh, maintenance of, of the protocol. And then move forward to 2010, one of the friends that I had in one of these IRC groups sent me an email uh, with uh, the Bitcoin white paper. And I recall very well reading the white paper and going, oh, that is a gossip protocol on amphetamine. And then the second thing that I thought was amazing is that the Bitcoin blockchain was solving the problem that we had in decentralized uh, peer file sharing system, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system, which was incentivization. Because if you recall correctly at the time, what did people do? You had the uploaders and the downloaders, and the uploaders used to leave their desktop open at night for the downloaders to come and pick the files from. But there was no incentivization. So we were spending money, spending electricity, but we, we weren't receiving any, any reward. And the creation of Bitcoin, uh, basically, as a reward for the miners, which is sort of the equivalent of the uploaders in the, in the Gnutella protocol, I thought was, was a brilliant, brilliant idea. All right. So, so you got into Bitcoin while you were still in legacy at places like Goldman or... JP Morgan, or how, how did you how did you follow crypto when you were still doing structured products and macro stuff? So well, that's the fortunate or unfortunate thing is that I received the paper in 2010 when I was starting my career at, uh, at Goldman. And unfortunately, I was like, ah, it's a great idea, but I have too much things to do. And I left it in the back of my head. Not very good, right? But then move back to uh, 2017, and that was during the ICO, during the ICO boom. And my co-founder, who's also one of my best friends, was very much involved in these in these ICOs. And he came to see me, and he was like, "Oh yeah, Amber, look at this." And I recall seeing big red flags there, going like, "Okay, this is definitely a security." Okay, did you guys check this from a legal point of view? Can we see the term sheet? Can we see? And I was like, "Oh my God, this is such a mess." But however, I was like, oh, my God, this is very, very powerful. Because uh, if you, you would compare it to what was going on in the VC space at the time, where it was very, very hard to raise money as a project just, you know, on, on a white paper and the rest, it was quite, uh, quite interesting. And add to that at the time, so at the time I was in trading, and what happened is we started having a revolution, especially in Europe, not as much as uh, in, in the U.S., where we had digital banks coming and eating market share from traditional retail banks. And I was like, you know what, can't we do something similar for investment banks? And this is how the initial idea of Alliance Block uh, came in. It's we wanted to use blockchain and new technologies to build a decentralized digital uh, investment bank, which today is a decentralized capital market. Right. You, took my, you stole my question. I was going to ask, are you trying to build a decentralized investment bank? So you've answered, answered that. Are you doing, you know, take me through a couple things. Like I know you're using Avalanche 
our guys have popped the hood on Avalanche and said they have a feature that might allow them to get involved in security tokens. So I know you guys are doing DeFi, security tokens, oracles. You know, you're you're doing a lot. How is it going trying to handle all those things at once? So I mean, it's a it's a very very good question. Uh, so we decided instead of focusing on one thing. So we're a little bit peculiar in this because most protocols have one problem, one solution, and we are actually focusing on on, on blocks. So we have multiple blocks uh, that uh, describe the vision that we have for capital markets. So what, how, how can you define capital markets in three words? You have the regulation and compliance, you have the data, and then you have the investment terminals or the issuance terminal. We call it the DeFi, the DeFi terminals. So we have these three blocks that are independent, but at the same time connected uh, to one another and can be used separately or can be used uh, or can be used together. So right now we have. I'm, I'm sure you must have seen that. So we have the exchange that is coming out. We have a decentralized exchange with minimal impermanent loss. Uh, that is uh, that is coming out. We have what we call trustless KYC AML. We have a, a data quasar that is focused on data. We have cross border regulation, um, uh, cross border uh, regulation uh, compliance protocols that basically turn all of the regulation based on jurisdiction into rule, into simple rules that you can use either on exchanges or use, you know, in traditional uh, traditional asset manager, traditional in uh, investment uh, investment banks. So is your are is your competitor like I don't know would you say it's like Polymath or Polymesh or the securities tokens player or do you consider no. yourself no no it, you know the security token question is a, is a very good question because I remember very much in 2019 where everyone was talking about security tokens and the the problem is there's not a lot of use cases and I, I will I will tell you why the equity markets are quite. Um, you know, quite evolved uh, and quite transparent, more transparent than crypto, uh, more efficient than crypto sometimes. The only issue we have in equity is the settlement, that T plus two settlements that can create huge margin calls and some financial disasters as we've seen with uh, uh, with Credit Suisse a few, uh, a, few uh, a few months back. But overall, from a risk opportunity perspective, rebuilding equity markets on the blockchain from scratch you know, not really. The only thing we need to solve is this T plus two settlement. However, for the bond market, which is a very antiquated market compared to equity, here you do have you you, you do have a use case. So you know, security token is an interesting one because it depends on what what you're securitizing, basically. So we have that aspect of the business, but we also have a a more uh, decentralized. Uh, aspect of the business where with pure DeFi products like, uh, you know, a yield generating products, yield strategies and the rest. All right. So tell me about the order of operations. In other words, did you go to somebody and say, hey, let's build an investment bank and they coded it? Or did a group of coders go, you know, we want to build this, but we need the structured product macro person. How, how did that evolve? Well, the great thing about the founding team is that the three of us come from very different backgrounds. Uh, so I, I come purely from investment banking. My co-founder, Rashid, is a quant, uh, and he has worked in investment banking, but at the same time, he has worked in artificial uh, intelligence. intelligence. Uh, and then the, our third co-founder is a pure tech guy, so a pure a pure developer. So between the three of us, when we were setting up the rules of the foundation of uh, of the protocols, we were we already knew where where we were going. We were or, already knew what what we could do and what what we couldn't do. And then with time, we started building the team. So we have multiple teams, each focused on a uh, on a particular on a particular module of the business. All right, interesting. So. You know, sort of shifting gears, you know, I see that you've been to, you know, done speaking engagements in places like, you know, Davos and say UN Women. You know, can you talk more about what you've done to help, you know, women get into crypto? I know at our firm, we're trying to, we're trying to boost the number of women, not only in the firm, but in the customer base. Yeah. You know, do you have, do you have any personal efforts or professional efforts you're doing to 
boost women's involvement in crypto? Well, it's not just women involvement in crypto. I think it's women involvement in uh, in uh, more male dominated uh, subjects in in general. So uh, I recently launched with a, with a colleague a social initiative that is called the Two Hundred Billion Club, and it is a, an, a type of accelerator where we have 50 plus VC partners with more than 900 billion uh, AUM. And our focus here is basically to invest in women founders and in women co-founders. I'm sure you know the numbers, less than 3% of all VC funds go to women founded or or co-founded companies. So this for me is quite important. We launched it two weeks ago. So ladies, if if you have a startup and you're looking for funding, please come to the 200 billion club. All right. So can you can you talk more about like where those where those people can find you? Like talk about your Twitter, your Instagram, like where where can those people find you or where can those people find that foundation? So it's at www.the200bn.club uh, and you can find me on Twitter at amber underscore gadar. And you can find me on LinkedIn. Usually, I answer my I answer my messages on LinkedIn. Uh, so, if you have any questions or if you want to get in touch, LinkedIn I would say is the simplest uh, simplest place. All right, excellent. That's the question I can't resist. What do you think about what's going on in the market now? I, I don't know how much market directional stuff you did with investment banks, but I mean, are you are you follow uh, how how closely are you following what's happening? And do you have any views or opinions? That you can share with us. I mean, it is. Uh, there's no no surprises here. I would say there's one interesting thing that occurred, maybe one day ago, is that when you had crypto rallying, you had the Nasdaq for once being down. One thing that we have noticed for the past, uh, I would say, since 2020, mid 2020, and the arrival of institutional players, and I will tell you why in a moment. We started seeing this correlation between Bitcoin and crypto with uh, risk on assets, particularly Nasdaq. And the more we advanced in 2021, the more this correlation increased and increased, which was slightly disappointing because we were, when we were talking about crypto earlier on in 2020 as an alternative asset class in an alternative allocation in your portfolio, what we were saying is that, you know what, this is an un- uncorrelated asset class. And then, bum, this thing become, became super, uh, super co- uh, correlated. Um, and finally, we saw an idiosyncratic event occurring in the markets with what was going on in Ukraine and then the crypto community coming together that maybe has created some extra enthusiasm. And we finally were outperforming when Nasdaq uh, when Nasdaq was underperforming. But I would say the Nasdaq has been quite a good bellwether for the move uh, for the move in crypto. And probably because we started having more and more institutional players coming in and balancing or rebalancing their portfolios the way they I mean they, they're taking out Nasdaq, then they would need to take out Bitcoin. They add Bitcoin, then they they add they add Nasdaq in in parallel and hence this increased uh, increased correlation. All right. Interesting. Appreciate that. So another gear shift, you know, who inspires you uh, in crypto and in your life? You know, I know that, you know, people who are looking to get into crypto will look up to you and then they may be interested in, you know, who do you look up to? Who who inspired you? Okay. Uh, that, that's a difficult one. Uh, who inspired me in, uh, who inspired me in crypto? Uh, I would say again, I mean, the, the Bitcoin white paper on incentivization i thought that was fantastic because that finally gave a solution to making sense of decentralization and and goes back to the idea that for every work you need a reward people don't 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 work for free uh, in in terms of uh, in terms of women uh, you're going to laugh but i would say dolly parton <laughs> uh, i am <laughs> no no I, I live in Texas. I, I, I think that's great. I, I mean, Tell us I, about I, it. I love Dolly Parsons' music. I didn't know the whole background story. And I think recently at night, you know, I couldn't sleep. And I watched the documentary on Netflix. And I was super impressed by this lady, you know. Not only is she a singer, songwriter who writes her lyrics, her music, a performer, beautiful voice. But she is such a shrewd businesswoman at a time where as a female artist you were 
fully under the control of the studios and fully under the control of uh, of, of your managers. So I mean, I was watching the I was watching the documentary and I was like, "Damn, girl, yeah, you know, I want you to come over for dinner." <laughs> All right, that's that's excellent. Do you have do you have any sort of advice or direction that you would give to say, I don't know, a young a young female student who's studying finance or women who want to get into crypto, you know, do you do you ever get asked a question like where where would they begin? Um I would give actually a uh, a network that is called the Bigger Pie. So the biggerpie.io, which is a one of the most active communities of women in blockchain around, where you find people that are very junior and people that are very, very senior. And the great thing about this community is that, you know, everyone helps everyone. It's a very active community. You have a problem, you have questions, people are here uh, to help you, people are here to guide you. There's, you know, job offers and job posts and, and uh, you know, courses and, and the rest. So I would advise anyone who has questions to go to the biggerpie.io. Interesting. All right. Shifting gears once again. I mean, and it's okay if the answer is no. Do you know anything about the crypto scene in Lebanon? I know they had a banking system problem. You know, are you familiar with or have any experiences? No. Well, I... So that's the problem with uh, the problem with emerging markets. Let me let me go back a little bit. Let me go back a little bit. The way I, I look at protocols in crypto, I look at protocols the same way I look at emerging markets. Okay. In emerging markets, you have what okay. we call a political risk, governance risk, credit risk. In protocols, we have governance risk, we have a security risk. And one of the reasons we have protocols that yield 1,000% on their stakes, it's because they are emerging market, because they are very, very risky. Um, you need time for countries and protocols to mature. And this maturation does not occur in one day or one night or, you know, 20, even, even 20 years. I would say one great thing about crypto is that we're very, very quick. Uh, ideas turns into product in less than three months, which is never occurs usually in the real world. But what does this mean? It means that the products that are put on the markets are products that are still not super tested. It's products that are not that have not gone through the due diligence that a normal product uh, goes through. This is why usually I defend protocols and I defend high yield and I defend these risky products for the simple reason that when you invest in them, it's like you're investing in Ghana or you're investing in Lebanon. In Lebanon, at a certain point, the the, the yield on the on the bond was 80 percent, right? I mean, I think now the yield on the Ukraine is somewhere around 80 percent. If I'm if I'm not uh, if if I'm not uh, incorrect, um, so you see there is a comparison between emerging protocols and emerging market. Now the issue with the Lebanon is a very very long and political issue that I would rather not uh, not discuss. No, no problem. All right. So uh, I noticed that you guys built on Avalanche, right? Is there anything that you could tell us as to why you picked Avalanche or was that is that in the hands of the developers? Did they talk to you about that? Well, we have a very close relationship with uh, Avalab. And as I said previously, we're blockchain agnostic. So we're looking to integrate on as many blockchains as uh, as we can. So Avalanche for us is uh, a, a natural a natural step. All right. All right, Amber, we appreciate you coming in today. Uh, is there is there anything else you want to let people know about, about Alliance or about you? Uh, yes, I want to say that uh, I am very excited about working on a new project that is called uh, MyG Nation, Build the Nation of Your Imagination, uh, which is a, an amazing experiment, a, amazing social, economical, and philosophical experiment in building a nation that connects the digital world with uh, the real world. Uh, in terms of economic, uh, you, I mean, we're going to release the white paper soon, but you will see in terms of economic, we're using some something called advanced quantity theory of meta money that uh, has a completely new way of looking at tokenomics. In terms of governance, we are using something from Alliance Block, which is called Calibrocracy, where basically the votes are not based on the number of tokens that you have, but they're based on a trivariate 
a model that looks at the amount of work, so the amount of code a developer puts into the protocol, the amount of authority, so the amount of help the community gives, and the amount of capital, so the amount of tokens that you have. So one of the big issues that I have currently with the DAOs is that capital is king, money is power, which is very, very sad when we're trying to find, uh, to, to fight uh, wild capitalism. And so calibrocracy is a, a much fairer way, way of, waiting, of waiting votes. And I would say the, the great thing about my generation is ideally, once we, w once we become a rich digital nation, we want to connect it to the real world, meaning people will have a digital passport. They will have citizenship of my generation. And with what's going on in the Ukraine now, we push the idea even further. And the way we visualize things is we want to buy an island and become an independent nation with our own economy, our own digital economy, our own uh, calibrocratic government. And you would have situation where you have Ukrainians that are now being kicked out into Poland as refugees. They will have a double nationality of my nation and Ukrainian uh, nationality. And then we will let the DAO vote to, Brit to take planes to bring them to this island somewhere in the Pacific where they can you know, wait until things stabilizes before going, going back to their homes. So I think this is a fantastic experiment of mixing the digital uh, with, the, with the real world. Very excited about this project. Yes, that sounds very exciting. So I just wanted to just read one part back to you. So, and I saw you talk about this at Davos. So you know, you're saying this world where capital begets capital, right? Where people can, with money, can borrow money, but people with no money can't yes. borrow money. Are, are you trying to help those people with both your metaverse project, it sounds like, and your DeFi yes. protocol? Is that is that something you had in mind definitely, when you built it? That, definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, the, 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 there is a, a big malaise uh, in, the, in the world. And we see it, uh, whether in the US, whether in Europe, whether in, in emerging markets. The problem is the unfair distribution of capital. And the, as I said, the more capital you have, the easier it is to borrow. You know, people who have billions, they borrow billions from bank at a very low interest rate, right? People who have knowledge, people who have experience, you cannot collateralize your knowledge and your experience to borrow. And this is unfair. And this is why we have calibrocracy in, in place, because you will the caliber of the person will give you the value of that person. And that caliber is not only money. It is money, work, and knowledge. All right. So by the way, did you invent that term calibrocracy? Is it, did I say it right? Yes. Did, did you invent that term or you I did? I did. I did. Yes. All right. Well, I, 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 it sounded great when you just said it. It sounded great when I heard you say it at Davos. And uh, I hope you win an award for inventing that concept. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, in the decentralized world of crypto, uh, we need a lot more of that. A lot more helping people connect to one another and get paid for working and community, not just for having money in general. All right, Amber, that's it for today, right? I appreciate you coming in, right? This is Bill Noble from Token Metrics. Uh, we will see you next time.